Hi, Neve. Hello, Fossi. How are you doing? I'm all right, thank you. Okay, good. Whereabouts are you at the moment? I'm on a deserted island in the Bermudas. No, I'm, I'm wow. swimming in uh, I'm swimming in Haifaru Bay, as you can see. In the cyclone. That's a good place <laughs> to be stuck. <laughs> <laughs> How's Probably lockdown treating you? Anyway, I'm in Germany. I'm in home in Frankfurt. Okay, very cool. Um, we had a bit of a technical issue, so I'll just give people a little bit more time um, to mm -hmm. log in. Um, but yeah, I like your background. <laughs> I like yours too. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you know which man that is? I don't actually, do you? Oh, uh, no, it's familiar. It's a familiar face, but... Um, it's not familiar to me. I don't know which man. Man, yeah. Oh, I don't know. Maybe. Okay, we've had someone comment that the link is working again. So I think we can probably get started. Um, okay, hi to everyone that's watching and thanks for joining our webinar again. Um, good to have you guys all with us. Today we have Neve Froman. He has been working with the Mantis Trust for around 10 years, I think, Neve. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah so ages. Um, and he's currently doing his PhD with the University of Cambridge, looking at mantid reproductive ecology. So he's gonna be telling us all about this today. Um, as always, I'll tell you the technical information. So for anyone watching your audio and video, it's automatically switched off, um, but we would love to hear from you. So if you have any questions or comments at any point, please put them in the Q&A box, which is on the Zoom toolbar, um, either at the bottom or the top of your screen. Um, and we will basically hear from Neve, and then we will take as many questions as we can for Neve at the end of the webinar. So we'll try to get through as many of your questions as possible um, and keep them coming. Okay, I'll hand it over to you, Neve. Cool. Oh. All right. So um, yeah, very quickly. Hi everyone. It's actually my first webinar, so uh, bear with me. Apologies for my English. I'm actually Italian, so you will hear my lovely Italian accent throughout this presentation. Uh, and yeah, as I said, it's the first, my first virtual seminar. So um, yeah, I'll try to pretend like you're all in front of me and try to be as interactive as possible. But um, yeah, it might be a little bit strange. So let me start by sharing my screen um, and my presentation. And I'm sure anyway, um, Flossie will let me know if Looks I make good. some mistakes or something goes wrong throughout <laughs> my my webinar. No, it looks so far good. good. Yeah. Brilliant. All right. So again, uh, well, as uh, Flossie said, um, I'm currently um, doing my PhD at the University of Cambridge. Uh, so this webinar will go through maybe not all about, but uh, some of the work that I've been doing, the background, what I've um, um, been doing and I've done, and what some of the results of my research are, and what are my next steps. But let's just go a step a little back. I know it's a typical, it's a common question. Um, what is your story? Who are you? Well, let me tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I actually had to get my mom to work a little bit to find some of the old pictures of myself. And here it is. Um, I've been in contact with water since I am a little child. I love water um, ever since I was born. And one of the anecdotes that my mom always tells me is that um, Apparently, the first time that they took me to the sea, I was about one year old. They, they uh, parked the car and they opened the door. I really somehow walked out of the door and they didn't even realize that I ran straight into the sea, jumped in the water, and a few minutes later, they turned around and there's a guy with holding me in his hands and bringing me to these people, uh, to my parents, uh, telling them that I was basically drowning and this guy had to come and save me. Um, so, yeah, I was drawn to water from a very early age. I almost um, yeah, ended my life fairly early there, uh, but it tells you a little bit about how much I love this element. And a little bit later in my life, I actually then became a semi-professional swimmer and it was <laughs> the best I could find. Sorry about that. Uh, but yeah, I was a um, semi-professional swimmer for about 10 years. Uh, yeah, about 10 years, a little bit longer actually. And so I spent every day um, within my youth, uh, about two to three hours in a swimming pool, 
swimming and training to yeah. um, it was no tropical water uh, uh, but yeah i love these elements um, let me do a big step i uh, graduated in natural sciences because i also love nature something that my grandparents um, um, inculcated in me a love for nature uh, but curiously um, although my love for the water i was actually never interested in marine biology and marine sciences during my studies i didn't choose any course uh, at, um, specifically on um, marine ecology or uh, water ecology i was not interested i was interested in earth science uh, i was interested in um, um, evolutionary biology and animal behavior but not marine biology it was sort of by chance that i ended up spending a few uh, a few months in the maldives working as um, as a marine biologist, but mostly actually doing the stuff that you see in this picture. Uh, dressing up as Santa Claus to entertain uh, guests and singing in the evening, again, to entertain clients, while during the day taking them out on snorkeling trips and teaching them a little bit about what they were seeing. So I was doing a little bit of everything, but this was my first real contact with the marine environment. And that's when I fell in love with it. And as I fell in love with it, I decided that I wanted to do more. And that's when I got involved with the Manta Trust and um, ended up now working with them for the past about 10 years. And there it is, myself, um, the boy, the, the, <laughs> the boy man, uh, with, uh, this actually really happened, um, a term decided to land on my head uh, while I was snorkeling with mantas um, during a field trip. Um, so this is a bit about my story and how I ended up where I am uh, in the mantis cycle. Um, but really what drew me to work with mantas is just the beauty of these animals which this short video will show you i'm sure you you already know about it if you're here listening to this talk it's because you love these animals and um and you're fascinated by them many of you have already swum with them before um yeah so i was lucky enough to work in the maldives work in an area where there's um where there was large aggregations of mantas and i just got fascinated by how how um curious inquisitive uh, big, uh, and how easy it was to actually interact with these animals in the water. So I decided that I wanted to do more, um, to study them, learn about them, and as I learned about them, I realized how um, how endangered they are, and so, um, so I decided to do something about it, and I got involved with my trust, and I've been there ever since. So let this video finish, because pretty, pretty images are always welcome. Um, especially now that we are uh, locked all at home, um, so we can get a little bit of uh, uh, eye candy. That was spotty, yeah, this is spotty. Um, just quickly also telling you that I think you can sort of react um, to the presentation. I think there are buttons where you can sort of give a thumb up or clap of hand that can show me that you are there. Um, in this presentation, uh, listening or pretending to listen, either in your underwear or while having a beer or while cooking. Uh, this is the fun thing about a webinar is that I don't see you, you do see me. So before uh, we dive into the, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> before we dive into my, um, uh, the topic of this presentation, a quick question, which actually some of the people that know me uh, probably are familiar with. And um, I'm going to launch a very quick short poll now. And I want you to uh, quickly answer to it if you can. Oh, I have to, sorry, Flossie, I think I have to end one poll in order to start the next one. Yeah, we can end that one. Okay. Hi there. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. So if you don't mind quickly answering to this question, the question, as you will see, is, you know, an alien comes to you um, now to your door and asks you, how do you define life on this planet? You have there a, um, a list of possible answers. <laughs> the first answer is the best, I'm sure. <laughs> so what would you respond to uh, this alien? <laughs> I'd love to be able to see what you guys are answering right now. And I see that sort of the majority, a lot of you are freaked out by this alien that just came, that just showed up at your door. Uh, um, but 
a good a good half of you um, are giving what to me is sort of the right answer. I'm not saying it yet. Uh, yeah, most of you already answered. So I'll tell you that the majority have said that um, that to them uh, they will answer it's the ability to reproduce. And another good amount <laughs> of people freaked out by the end. Um, so Cool. Yeah. <laughs> you can actually see the result. Uh, I can show them to you. Yeah. So yes, uh, why reproduction and why uh, why they choose to study it? To me, one of the most uh, fascinating aspects of it is that reproduction is really the definition of life, is the meaning of life. Um, life started on our planet the moment the first um, molecule developed the ability to reproduce, to duplicate, and to create copies of itself. And this is the moment, the moment life exploded on our planet in the diversity that we see today. Um, you know, uh, songs of birds, amazing uh, lacking behavior, um, the parades, the nuptial parade of a, of a peacock, as well as singing birds and singing humpback ways, all that is with one soul. Um, um, goal and the goal is to reproduce the copies of yourself. So to me, this is already a fascinating aspect about reproduction and really drives my interest in this, uh, in this topic and understanding why, um, how, why, how, and why uh, certain animals reproduce. In my case, obviously, uh, mantis. So why studying uh, mantis reproduction? Well. Of course, reproduction is fundamental and it's what guides life on our planet, but also uh, understanding that some of the factors related to reproduction, uh, it's really important in order to better understand how, um, how vulnerable the species is. There are models that require uh, to know how often an individual reproduce, um, uh, how long it takes to reach sexual maturity, and those aspects tells us a lot about how fragile the species is um, on our planet and obviously based on these facts we can then justify certain conservation strategies and we can better target them uh, to improve the conservation status of a species and that's true for mantas as well as for any living organisms on our planet. But what do we know so far about the reproduction of manta rays? You've already probably heard a lot about it in previous presentations, previous seminar seminars, uh, so let me quickly tell you a few facts uh, so we do know that manta rays uh, mature, reach sexual maturity extremely late in their life. Um, it takes well, uh, about yeah, between sort of five to 10 to 15 years. Um, different results have been found in different um, areas. Uh, in the Maldives um, studies, uh, study the, the research of our very, um, our very CEO, uh, Dr. Guy Stevens, uh, found out that manta rays reach sexual maturity, uh, males reach maturity at around 10 years of age, while females reach it at about 15 years of age. So very, very late in their life. These are animals that live for about 40 years, so they are long living species, but also takes a long time to reach sexual maturity. They have a very, very low fecundity. Again, there is quite a variation geographically, and in the Maldives, which is the, actually the study site that I chose for my PhD, uh, the fecundity of manta rays is extremely low. Uh, one, they, um, yeah, so they, they reproduce on average every one, uh, sorry, every seven years. Sorry about it. Um, what you can see above here in this graph are simply um, so, uh, number of um, uh, pregnant females within a core group of 50 adult females and how many were pregnant every year. They have first that. So for example, in 2008, this tells you that 40% of the mature females were pregnant, uh, while in 2010, 11, 12, 0% of those mature females were pregnant. And based on uh, all these numbers, uh, what's been found out is that females in the Maldives reproduce only once every seven years. So one of the least fecund animals on our planet. They also have a very complex uh, behavior, as you can see in this video. Uh, you probably already heard about mating trains, you know what they are, females leading males in towards them a dance, which is a way, of course, for the female to select the fittest, the strongest um, uh, male, 
to then mate with, uh, courtship uh, behaviors that can last for days, and uh, they're obviously extremely complex. Uh, manta rays, the female sometimes uses um, obstacles uh, that are present underwater as well as divers to make the race more complex for the, for the males in order to really select the really the strongest, the best male. And finally, they have a very, very long uh, gestation. Again, um, for a marine animal, one of the longest, uh, it's 12 and a half months longer than our gestation. Um, and they only give birth with one pup at a time, occasionally, very rarely, uh, two. This image here is um, probably, uh, you know, there's probably two pups in there. You can see she's heavily, heavily pregnant in there. Um, but most of the time, manta rays only give birth to one pup at a time. So you can quickly uh, realize how very few um, um, pups this any manta rays have throughout their life. They reach sexual maturity at around 15 years of age. Females, they leave for about 40, and they only reproduce every one to seven years, giving birth to one pup at a time. So they. All right, guys, just bear with us while we try and get Neve back, hopefully, in a in a minute or two. Oh, there he is. Oh, I'm sorry, I don't know Hi. what happened. <laughs> <laughs> My connection uh, decided to crash. <laughs> okay, no uh, worries, it was just a couple minutes, couple seconds. Um, so let me share it again. I'm glad I'm glad you're back. <laughs> okay. You see me again? All good? Yeah, perfect. Sweet. Okay. Um, so, um, yeah, knowing, um, you know, based on some of the uh, facts that we know about the life of a manta ray, uh, we know that they reach very late maturity, they produce very few offsprings, they reproduce very infrequently. Um, most likely, then, that what that means is that their habitat is going to be fragmented and small, and they are going to have uh, anthropogenic pressures uh, due to overfishing or uh, human presence, ecotourism, and so on, is obviously going to be very high, important, and quite constant. Um, so better understanding more, more in-depth um, aspects about reproduction is really important to better define how to protect these animals again. But what are the challenges when it comes to study reproduction? Uh, what one is the logistical challenges. It's obviously not, not animals that you can keep in a tank, uh, fortunately, I would say, um, although some attempts um, exist. But um, so in order to study them, uh, we have to go uh, dive in their natural habitat, which can be not very easy at the moment, definitely uh, difficult. Um, so there are logistical challenges when it comes to study them. You have to know how to scuba dive, you have to get close to a wild animal, and you have to find them in an ocean which is quite large. Um, there are also challenges related to uh, ways to define if an animal is pregnant and mature. So at the moment we use, uh, or until not long ago, the main um, features that were used were external visual signs of maturity and gestation, for example, the, pregnancy of a, uh, the presence of a pregnancy bulge, as you can see in this image right there, uh, was used to determine whether an animal is pregnant or not. Uh, the presence of mating scars, uh, which are caused by the male during the binding of, uh, uh, during, the, during copulation, uh, are used to determine whether a female is mature or immature, and the length of a class of male. But those are not necessarily reliable, and you will see that uh, in a little bit. There's also need to better uh, to find out better ways of measuring these animals. Again, we cannot restrain them, uh, so we, we cannot sort of fish a manta out to measure it. Um, uh, it's quite obviously quite stressful for the animal. Uh, so a few uh, methods that have been used are visual estimates, which are obviously not as precise. Uh, pair laser, pair, pair laser, laser uh, photogrammetry has been used, so they use sort of pointed uh, lasers on an animal at, at a known distance on from which we can extrapolate the actual size of the animal. These have been used as well, uh, but they're not as they're not precise enough to be able to give us um, a clear image of the growth rate, for example. So there's need for more accurate 
ways of measuring these animals. And of course, invasive methodologies are to be avoided. So again, uh, you know, restraining an animal uh, to, um, to collect blood samples, measuring it, um, killing it, of course, forget about it. Uh, but even biopsy sampling, although it's minimally invasive and of course it doesn't really impact the life of Amanda as much as possible, um, it is to be avoided. So for my research, um, I've used actually ultrasonography, uh, I'm using ultrasonography, it's ultrasound, uh, which has actually been used in the past already uh, quite extensively to study the reproduction of fishes. It has to be, it has been used successfully. It is a reliable method to determine, for example, if fish is pregnant uh, or mature, immature, and so on. But, um, but so far, it has required um, the need to, to um, restrain the animal, getting it out of the water, as you can see in these images. It has been used in mantas as well, uh, in aquariums, um, and also in the wild. But in those cases, again, as you can see in this image, um, it was not as, e as easy. First of all, the, uh, the unit is quite heavy and bulky, not easy to maneuver underwater, and it does require to make contact um, with, the, with the animal. And in this case, there's also a need for another diver to hold on the mantle. You can quickly see how, first of all, it's very stressful for the animal itself and not easy to perform in um, wild conditions and on wild animals. But luckily, uh, so the new ultrasound device has been made available recently. Which, uh, which provides a great, great tool to study the reproduction of mantis in the wild. And it's a contactless, waterproof, and, and uh, very light unit that we can take underwater down to over 30 meters. It doesn't require to actually make contact with the manta because it uses water as a transmission medium. Uh, so the signal, the ultrasound, uh, travels in the water uh, without needing to to actually touch the subject as you would do if you go for an ultrasound if you're pregnant, for example, or you need gel. And it's very light, it's only half, uh, half a kilo, it's easy to bring on a water maneuver, and it records the images directly on the phone via Wi-Fi signal, which surprisingly works also underwater, although on, within a very, very short range. So this is what I've been using for my research, still using, and all my colleagues in the moment are actually using. And the other tool I'm using is uh, stereo video photogrammetry, which has the icon that you see up there. It might be a little bit panicking words, but don't worry about it. Uh, and also sort of the maths behind it, I don't understand it myself very clearly. Uh, but basically, um, it, it's a unit made up of two uh, cameras who are at a slightly different angles and point in the middle that sort of record a subject from two different angles and via uh, triangulation. It, and generate a size, a very precise size of, of the subject that you're filming. And what is great is that you can use it on moving animals. So we can actually film. That's why video photogrammetry rather than, um, yes, yeah, so photograph, uh, because we are taking a video and selecting frame by frame, choosing the frame that you want. And based on that frame, we can then measure the size of uh, the animal. It's very accurate. It's been already used extensively uh, on land as well, uh, but also um, to study. Um, Marine communities, and it's been proven to be uh, extremely accurate. Uh, until not long ago, <laughs> actually, the unit that we were using, and I actually dove uh, and redove with those kind of um, studio video programming units. Units were extremely heavy. I think that was about 10, 10 or so kilos. And free diving with that in Hanifaru Bay was horrendous. Uh, but luckily, uh, as technology advances at the speed of light nowadays. Uh, we have a much lighter unit made up of uh, GoPro, which are very light, and so much, much easier to bring underwater. And that's what me and my colleagues are using at the moment to measure mantis. Uh, so uh, some of the results, uh, some of the data collected. Um, the ultrasound has been used now for over a year, and it's uh, mainly used on cleaning stations in the Maldives, where animals are easy to be uh, found and approached. Uh, they are already more uh, tame at those cleaning stations because they're used to having cleaning stations coming nearby. And so what we do is we bring uh, this unit either by free diving or scuba diving. In this case, I'm scuba diving about 20 meters uh, with scooter, which makes things easier. And we approach the manta from the back. Uh, that allows this way 
um, first of all, provides us clearer images of what we're looking at, so reproductive structures, but also um, it's much easier to approach the manta this way without, uh, without scaring it. The manta doesn't even feel that you're coming uh, if you're slowly approaching from, uh, from above and don't really react um, to, to our scanning it. And we scan the left, uh, the top, the left side, because that's where uh, the reproductive structures that I'm interested to look at are located, and you'll see that in a second. So, um, so far, uh, we've managed to collect uh, 83 ultrasound examinations of 46 different animals, and the scan duration has varied quite a lot. Uh, some animals seem to not like as much the ultrasounds as um, others. In some cases, we've been able to scan an animal for five, six minutes. Uh, while in some other cases with just a, a few seconds. So there's quite a variation in the length of the ultrasound. And before I show you some of the uh, um, sonograms, so the images from the ultrasound, let me quickly explain you very shortly something about the anatomy of a mobuli gray. Um, so this is a mobula opened up. Uh, they have a massive liver, uh, which is very important in the asthma branks, as you know if you know a little bit about the asthma branks, uh, liver is uh, has a high content of oil which allows this animal to, um, uh, to float or aid their um, buoyancy. They don't have, um, um, uh, oh gosh, sorry, uh, um, swing bladder. Uh, asthma branks don't have a swing bladder so the liver and the oil con contained in the liver uh, makes up for, uh, for that. So that's why massive, massive livers uh, this is a gallbladder there. Um, underneath that, once we remove the liver, we have the digestive system, which just as ours is the stomach, uh, which makes a curve here. Uh, so it's sort of called cardiac and pyloric stomach, and the duodenum, and well, the spiral valve, which is kind of equivalent to our uh, intestine, but it's, but it's much short, shorter, uh, and it has sort of its own. Uh, spiral, and that's why it's spiral valve. It's a spiral inside, and obviously allows final digestion of food. But underneath that is what is really interesting to me, at least, which are uh, the reproductive uh, structures, the uterus, uh, and actually mantas mobility rays have two uteri, but only one is functional, and it's the one located on the left side of the animal. Uh, that's why I told you that I'm scanning the left. You can see the one on the right as well, but it's a tropic. On the ultrasound, you don't actually see it. The ovaries just like, just the same. They are present on both sides. You cannot even see them on the on the right, but they're quite clearly visible on the left. Uh, so this is what I'm I'm really interested. In. And the same features have been found in all mobuli grays, where it's the uh, only one uh, of the two uh, uteri that is functional, and it's always the left. Why? It's really un unclear. And here you can see an image of the skeleton, which I'll show again in a second. So here are some of the um, anatomical structures that I've been able to visualize on ultrasound. Uh, the bronchial arches, which are those um, cartilaginous structures that support the gills of the manta. Here you see the liver, which is uh, what we mostly see on an ultrasound because it's massive and it has this grainy um, uh, characteristic coloration uh, connected here to the spleen. And close contact with the spleen. And here we see the vertebral column, uh, which is that. Uh, so, what, so why is important? Why is it important to be able to identify and, and be able to distinguish those um, uh, the structures? Is that they allow me to tell to, to know where I'm looking at an animal. So if I know that uh, this is the vertebral, vertebral column, I know that I'm roughly here uh, in the animal. And based on this, I can sort of locate where the reproductive structures might be. So it was important also to, to be able to see other stru structures other than the reproductive ones. But I've also been able to uh, visualize uterus, fetus, and some more finer details of the reproductive structures uh, and the fetus um, within the mantle, which was quite exciting. So on the top left here, what you see is a longitudinal scan of a pregnant manta. This is the skin of the mum, uh, where it's skin and muscle, of course, and here starts the uterus. Um, the black is fluid. What you normally see dark in an ultrasound is liquid fluid. 
and what is bright uh, as um, either um, you know, skeleton or uh, surface uh, of, a, of an organ um, that reflects uh, ultrasound. So what we see here is the fluid in the uterus, and this is a longitudinal section of the fetus, pretty much possibly here. What is interesting to see are these little black spots in there, which are the ceratotrichia, which if we go back to the skeleton quickly, are the um, skeletal supports of the pectoral fin, which look like long spines or rays we see here. And that's why when you cut them longitudinally, they look like little black spots there. So this is the fetus inside the mantle. We can clearly tell that this animal was pregnant here. And here's a um, video scan. Obviously what I'm doing while, oops, sorry. Uh, what I'm doing is that I'm taking a video uh, of, the sonogram is actually a video, it's not just a, a screenshot, and then I select um, the moment that I'm on, the, the screenshot that I'm, in, that I'm uh, mostly interested in. So here we see the fetus, and then that's the spot. So a very short uh, scan can be enough to detect whether an animal is pregnant or not. Here we see an empty uterus, for example, again, fluid filled. Um, and we will see in a second that we found out that the presence of a visual um, uterus is important to determine the maturity of an animal. So of these 83 um, ultrasound examinations that we've done, we have some interesting findings. Um, uh, what I didn't tell you, sorry, I quickly go back. This uh, is important to, to know what they are. The trophonemata that you see here are those billy looking uh, structures inside the uterus which secrete nutrients that are, um, that, that are then dissolved in the uterine fluid and that are used by the fetus to feed on. So um, there is no umbilical cord, but the mother uh, feeds its fetus through these trophonemata. So the trophonemata basically release those nutrients in the fluid and the fetus will feed on them actively in the uterus. So they're quite important in the development of a fetus. And what we found out uh, with a few measurements, those are very preliminary results. Uh, and we have a few scans where the, uh, where the fetus is visible and the trophonemata are visible, but there seem to be a correlation between the length of those trophonemata and the size of the fetus. So if this will be proven to be true with more data, it will be an indication that uh, the length of the trophonomata could be used to determine the status of the gestation, gestational status of an animal, how far into the pregnancy an animal is. And uh, through also um, the analysis and uh, field work that I've done in Sri Lanka and examinations of, um, of various mobility rays, uh, have, um, we now know that the presence of a visible uterus is indicate, um, indicates maturity in an animal. While um, if the uterus is not visible under ultrasound, we can, um, um, we can determine that the animal is immature. And using this feature to determine maturity and immaturity within an animal, I've looked at the data uh, that I've gathered so far and of the 31 animals for which we have an ultrasound examination, uh, eight of them were incorrectly identified as immature while using only visual signs. Um, while they are actually, uh, sorry, yeah, while they're actually mature. So that means that uh, by using only visual external signs, so the presence of mating scars or, or the presence of a pregnancy bulge, we are actually underestimating the number of mature individuals within a population, which means that the fecundity or the amount of individuals that are contributing to reproduction, reproduction is even lower than what we actually um, have calculated so far. Ultimately meaning that uh, manta rays are even more vulnerable than we think. 
measurement wise, we thank to my colleagues in the Maldives who have been absolutely fantastic at collecting data uh, and collecting measurements of mantas and sending me lots and lots of amazing uh, videos from the stereo video camera. Uh, we have more than 3,000 measurements uh, of um, independent, in, independent measurements of 185 different animals, and those come from three different atolls Lamu, Ba, and Ra atoll, which are located at and Rari in the north, while Lamo is in the south of the Maldives. Uh, by looking at those measurements, um, I've determined that the, the measurements are quite accurate. Uh, the coefficient of variation, so the variation of the measurement of the same individual is only 1%, just over 1%, so very, very low, very precise way of measuring uh, mantis. And measurements have been taken from different angles, dorsally, ventrally, so we're filming from the back from the top, from the front, from different sides of the animal. But what has been uh, established is that the most accurate way of uh, measure manta is from the back. And if you can, you can appreciate that from this image, um, you know, if you're filming from the back, you can easily determine when the animal has its pectoral fin perfectly stretched out, while it's very difficult to determine whether this um, manta um, has its pectoral fin perfectly stretched or slightly bent up or down because we don't be able, we just cannot see it. Uh, so most of the measurements have been taken from the back, so caudally, uh, which allow me to determine uh, the best uh, moment of um, the moment where the animal has its pectoral feet scratched. Um, of these measurements, looking at them all together, uh, the average size of female is uh, end up being about three, uh, 3.3 3 meters, 330 centimeters, that's based on 100, just under 120 uh, different mantas. Male are confirmed to be about 30% uh, smaller, so 284 was the average size of males. The smallest measured manta, uh, very cute little um, coco, uh, very cute little manta uh, in Ra Atoll, uh, measured 1 meter, 1.6 meters, just about uh, the width of your open arms and the largest manta measured just under four meters in the Maldives. This is um, a little bit smaller than in other areas, uh, Mozambique, um, Japan, and those mantas, the estimate there are higher, but again we don't really know if that's due to the um, methodology used to measure. These are the results in the Maldives. What's uh, to me quite interesting uh, when we look at the, at the different sites from where these measurements come from, something interesting uh, appears. Uh, here are the uh, average disc width, uh, disc width or wing to wing um, size of mantas at different locations. And what you can see here is that Mamunagao, which is a lagoon in Rato in the north, the mantas that are present in this site uh, are clearly much smaller than anywhere else. Um, all the other sides, the, the sizes and all the other sides are kind of all similar. For females, we're around 3.5, 3.3 meters, the average being 3.3. For males, again, 2.8, 2.9, that's kind of the average. Um, most of the sides, but something strange happens in Mamunagawa. Well, we have tons and tons of small mantas. So that's a very clear and empirical indication of this site possibly being a puffing or a nursery ground for mantas. Uh, we know of very, very few uh, nursery areas. There are very few nursery areas for mantas known worldwide, and this could be uh, one of the first um, empirically established um, nursery sites uh, for mantas in the world. There's certainly more, but uh, still to be discovered. Um, so my research is still at the very beginning. There's a lot, a lot that I plan to do. Um, obviously. One of the first thing is to determine better sizes and maturity when our males and females become mature. What's the size, the size, the rough size at which they become mature, which are important, um, along with uh, growth rates, are uh, important uh, parameters that are used in uh, population, the so-called population vulnerability models. So models that define how vulnerable the population is to, for example, overfishing or other anthropogenic pressures. So a better understanding of size and maturity and growth rates are necessary because the current ones are not very accurate. So the goal of my, one of the goals of my research is to uh, generate 
more accurate data on those uh, particular parameters. Uh, also, looking at size class segregation, as what I've showed you, it's really, really uh, important and provides us really cool uh, information about, again, uh, areas important as nursery grounds, as popping grounds, or areas used just by adults, uh, areas key for reproduction. So looking at that, uh, looking at size class segregation um, would be another one of the goals of my PhD and would be really important in order, in order to then um, um, uh, target, better target conservation efforts. If we know that, if we know of a nursery area, we can then put in place um, specific measures to protect that area more um, uh, efficiently. Um, I also plan to calculate or determine survival mortality rates and look how these fluctuates geographically and spatially. Um, what is really interesting is that, at least in the Maldives, it looks like, for example, fecundity is not um, fluctuates uh, in, in time and also geographically. So there's some years with lots and lots of reproduction, some years with very, very little reproduction. And what I, what I plan to, uh, what I, I would like to find out is what are the uh, factors responsible for such fluctuations? Is it um, food availability? Is it um, tourism pressure? Uh, is there any factor in that, that sort of, um, is responsible for this fluctuation, fluctuation or is it just a natural cycle? And if there are factors uh, that are responsible for fluctuations in mortality and reproduction and survival, how can we mitigate those? And so how can we better preserve these animals? A lot of things still to do. Like as I said, I'm still at the beginning of my research. And the exciting thing is what comes next. And before I finish, I would like to thank, of course, all the, um, all the ones that have made my work possible, starting from, of course, the Man Trust, uh, Betsonic, which is a company that um, made the ultrasound device possible. Uh, together with IMD Imaging, uh, resorts that have, hosted, that have hosted me in the Maldives, all my colleagues that, have, that are sending me data um, nonstop. And um, yeah, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you all for, uh, for having tuned in. Again, apologies for my English, and I hope it was interesting and relatively good. Thanks. Hi, Dave. <laughs> Sorry, I went quiet. A the way you think. Um, Perfect. That was so interesting. Cool. Thank you. I can't believe we've done 3000 SVP measurements. Is that yeah, what I know? <laughs> it's incredible. Amazing. So for me, that was so interesting because I've collected some of that data. So it's interesting to see the results come to life. And yeah, especially cool about Mama Nagao um, being yeah, that's a central really, really, uh, nursery really area. Smart. Okay, we'll launch in with the questions. Um, we have one from Modex here. He's asking, how long after mating does it take before mantis give birth? After mating? Mm, that's a good question. Uh, well, the, the gestation time is 12 and a half months, uh, but uh, the truth is that um, we don't yet know whether, um, whether mantis are capable to um, store sperm. Um, which is known to have to occur in many different species of elasmobranchs. Uh, so lots of elasmobranchs basically return, retain the sperm of males for months, sometimes in some cases up to a year or more, and they basically decide when to use that sperm to, um, to fertilize the egg. In which case, um, the apparent gestation might be longer. The actual gestation is the same length, but um, parturition or birth happens obviously much, much later in time. Uh, we haven't really been able to look at that in manta rays in detail. And so we don't really know for sure if uh, they are capable of storing sperms, in which case, you know, it, it could, birth could even happen much later than 12 and a half months, which is the gestation time. Um, the truth is that, yeah, again, we don't really know. Okay. Cool, thanks. Um, we have a question that came through on the emails that's actually related to this. Um, somebody was wondering why we see pregnant female mantas in courtship trains. Um, are, they, are they mating to store sperm after they give birth or, or do we know? 
um, as again, uh, there's very, very few um, empirical data. There's very few observations of mating. Um, the, the most interesting come from uh, from aquarium from Okinawa, where uh, the manta that's that have given birth in both occasions, the manta gave birth and made and made it straight away, uh, straight after birth. So that's why we often see sort of pregnant mantas followed by males. We assume that that's happening in the wild as well. Males mate straight after birth with a female. It's possible, uh, again, these are just speculations, but it's possible that um, mating right away after birth or the first male that mates right after birth has a higher uh, probability of becoming the father of the next, um, of the next uh, pups. Uh, if there is sperm competition, so if multiple males, like we know that, we know that mantas mate with multiple males, um, and if sperm competition occurs, so if multiple males are, uh, sperm of multiple males are, are present at the same time in the female, uh, it's possible that the one that was first has a certain kickstart and a higher probability of, of um, fertilizing the egg. So that's probably. Okay, very interesting. Sense. They need to get in there first then. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Okay, um, next one from Edward. Edward has asked, do we know why the fecundity and sexual maturity age varies in different location? Does this variety support the theory that major manta populations are completely separate without migration between them? Um, yes, let's do the second answer. Uh, certainly, I mean, there, there certainly is some movement, but um, uh, most likely the difference in fecundity and age and maturity uh, well, age and maturity mm, might be also related to the methodology, but fecundity can also be related to methodology, but uh, there's certainly some variation geographically, which might be actually linked to, for example, food availability, which is probably the main driver of uh, reproduction in mantis and the this animal. Reproduction for mantis rate requires a lot of energy, a lot of pores, so they need to feed very efficiently. And um, if food is available, mantis will mate regularly, while if food is not available, uh, they will probably uh, avoid mating. So areas where food availability is more regular and more constant and more predictable, uh, in those areas, mantis will mate uh, constantly, while in, our, in other areas where the availability fluctuates, the availability of food fluctuates much, much more, in those areas, we'll see the same in, in regards to reproduction. And again, this, is sort of, this will be hopefully the end of my, my, my research. And then I'll be able to have uh, sort of a long data set that spans across a number of years, looking at fecundity and uh, growth rates as well. Um, so if we see that growth rates fluctuate, fluctuates, sorry, uh, within years, um, and what I would like, what I plan to do is looking at um, what are the possible anthropogenic and natural factors that are responsible to that. So again, food availability. Uh, plankton concentration in the water, sea surface temperature, or even clim climate, um, climatic patterns might be responsible for that. So surely the fact that we see differences geographic in, in different populations uh, supports the, the fact that these are uh, separated populations because um, they, they respond to local um, conditions. If that makes sense. Okay, thank you. We've got a really Good one from Steffi here. She's asking if mantas enjoy sex. <laughs> well, you're gonna have to go and ask a manta that. <laughs> but um, I, I would, uh, if I would have to guess, I'll probably say um, no. We often see bleeding claspers, made of bleeding claspers, which I wouldn't say are signs of enjoyment. Sure. Um, <laughs> Uh, whether females enjoy it, um, I really don't know. <laughs> You're going to have to go and ask Amanda. <laughs> but it is a very interesting question for sure. It's a good question, but it's very um, short, isn't it? The Amanda sex. So you'd think maybe it wasn't that enjoyable. Yeah, yeah 15 seconds. That <laughs> <laughs> okay. was an hour of hard work for just 15 seconds of. Of glory. <laughs> <laughs> Good question, Steffi. Thank you. 
Okay, we have one from Tanya. Tanya is asking, how long are mating scars visible on pregnant mantas? And have you seen any mating scars on medium or far-term mantas? So just tell us a bit more about mating scars. Uh, right, yes. So mating scars, we have to distinguish two different types of mating scars. So the dorsal mating scars, which are the ones I showed in the picture earlier. I don't know if you want me to share the screen and show them again. Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, I don't, yeah. Oh, I'm at the right page. How about that? Oh, perfect. Oh, no, I, I was not. <laughs> Here. So those are um, dorsal mating scars. And those are actually, once they appear, um, once they take the use, they actually remain on the mantle for its entire life. So they're present for the rest of its life. And that's why they're used as indicators of maturity in male mantles. Uh, once we see them, we can be sure that this animal has made it before. While uh, there, are, there is a second type of mating scar, of which I don't have a picture, and it's a ventral mating scar. So it's sort of uh, it's on the underside, still on the left side, because that's what normally they make. And it would look like sort of, um, reddish uh, stripes on the underside of the left pectoral fin toward the edge. And those actually disappear within a couple, within a month or so, month and a half or so. Um, curiously, they don't seem to disappear on oceanic mantas. We see them um, sort of scar and they, they kind of remain, but on reef mantas, they they become invisible after a month or so. So they are also very important because they tell us that uh, this animal has made it very recently. Um, but uh, again, they, you know, they disappear um, within a month or so. So if there's no dorsal mating scars left by that mating uh, event, then we wouldn't be able to tell if that animal has made it after two, three months. There will be no sign left anymore. That's why using visual signs is not as reliable as, for example, ultrasonography. Okay, um, another one on mating scars. Innes has asked if you've ever seen mating scars in males, male mantas. <laughs> um, we've had a we've had a um, kind of a yeah an internal discussion about this uh, within the Manta Trust, me, Guy, and some other colleagues in Lamoto because there are yeah I have seen males with mating scars um, or with what appear to be mating scars. And, but it's very, very unlikely that those are actually many scars. It might be, they, they, they most likely are just injuries caused, caused by something else. Could be a hook stuck on, on the pectoral fin that obviously just like an injury caused by the biting of a maze that scratches away skin from the animal leaving a scar that may look like a maze scar. Uh, so, um, I mean, we don't know for sure, but it's unlikely that there is, um, the gay mind and like that. Okay, cool. I bet that was an interesting discussion. <laughs> it was, yeah. <laughs> okay, we've got one from Harrison. Thanks for tuning in again, Harrison. Um, he's asking what part of your research you're most excited about. Um, all of it, to be honest. Um, it's all it's all very it's all really really exciting. Um, surely the ultrasound, it's um, yeah, it's it's very special because it's the first time we, you know, we see ultrasound images of manta rays. Um, it's a unit that was never available before to study mantas. Um, you know, it's a brand new world that you're exploring. So this is really, really exciting. I remember when the first time that I managed to, or that I identified and I saw fetus in an ultrasound of a manta, I jumped and then my heart started beating really fast. Oh my God. And that was certainly very, very exciting. So, um, um, yeah, so seeing and seeing ultrasound images of manta rays is very, very cool. Um, yeah, understanding more about how they made and how they reproduced the, uh, is very, very interesting, very exciting. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I remember seeing um, ultrasounding one manta blob and and thinking she wasn't pregnant, and then you said she was pregnant once she'd looked at the scans, and that was super exciting to know that yeah. you've seen that fetus inside okay um we have one from Ines again she has asked um if you have any theories on why they have two um uteri or uteruses how would we say that 
uteri. Uh, uteri. Um, and whether it could be um, an extra help for the fetus providing nutrients or an impact buffer, or if you have any other thoughts on that. Good, very, very good question. Uh, very good question. Thank you. I haven't really, to be honest, thought about it. Um, uh, they are bilateral uh, mantas, so just. Um, um, I would suspect it's probably a, a remnant um, feature from um, species from which mantaris have, de have developed, which have two functional uteri, two functional um, um, oviducts, and two functional ovaries. And in mantaris, probably because of the reproductive strategy that uh, they adopt, which you know, invest a lot in one fetus, probably that's the reason why one became a trophic. So we are probably at the stage where. Uh, they used to be too um, functional one and uh, to, to minimize waste of energy, one is slowly, slowly become a tropic and you know, it's meant to keep on um, existing for millions of years that the second, the, the right one might sort of fully disappear. Just, just um, speculating here. Okay. Cool, thank you. I think we'll just take one more question. So we'll ask you what we've asked a few people about what your favorite book that you'd recommend um, for our reading list would be on the natural mm -hmm. world. Um, yeah, so I, I'm a big fan of uh, Stephen Jay Gould, which maybe many of you already know about. So he's, uh, uh, he was an evolutionary biologist, a paleontologist, uh, famous for his theory about uh, punctuated equilibrium. Uh, he wrote tons of books, um, and they're all very, very short, so natural, natural history stories. And my favorite book is um, Eight Little Piggies. Um, and they are all very, very short um, yeah, stories that teach you something about the natural history, um, but in a very, very uh, inspiring way. So any book by Stephen Jay Gould is highly, highly recommended. OK, cool. Thank you, Neve. I think Thank we'll you. wrap Thank up. Thank you everyone then. for tuning in. Thank you everyone for listening. Thank you Flossie for hosting it. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed yourself. I definitely enjoyed your talk. Um, yeah. Thanks. Okay guys, so thanks for joining again. Um, we do have Neve back with us next Friday. So that's the 22nd and Neve's going to be talking about Manta expeditions. So that's the uh, research trips that you can do with Manta Trust all over the world. Um, so you can ask him some more questions then. As always, we love to have your support. So you can find out more information about supporting us and about Manta Rays on our website and on our social media pages, which are on the screen now. Um, one of the best ways you can support us is by joining the Cyclone. Um, it's a members only hub where we share all of our latest research, but you can also adopt a Manta and do lots of other things um, to help us out at this slightly tricky time. Um, and yeah, looking forward to seeing you next week, Neve. Um, yeah. And tom there. tomorrow we have Lydia Green. She is from the Manta Watch New Zealand project, and she's going to be talking about manta rays in New Zealand. Those are oceanic mantas. Um, and she will be on at 9 a.m., so super early because um, she is quite far ahead in New Zealand time. But we hope to see some of you there. Okay, bye Neve. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. <laughs> bye everyone. Bye, Lucy.